Hey folks, AP Chemistry Time. We're on podcast 3.4 now. We're going to look at um, how to tell if something's being oxidized or reduced and how to assign oxidation numbers. So let's just get right to it, shall we? Oxidation and reduction you studied a little bit last year, so we're going to have a time of review. Oxidation initially meant the combination of an ele element with oxygen to produce oxides, like this, carbon plus oxygen to make carbon dioxide, or um, here's an example with methane to make carbon dioxide and water. So combustion, basically, right, is an oxidative process. Um, also, you could have the reduction, where you lose the oxygen from the compound, so it's like the opposite of combustion. We take the oxygen away, like we took the oxygen away from the um, ferric oxide here. So that was the initial definition of oxidation and reduction. But then we learn more. Um, there's some compounds that don't have oxygen. So we know both processes of oxidation and reduction occur simultaneously because um, it's about electrons moving around. So we call them redox reactions for short because it's oxidation and reduction at the same time. So. For reactions that don't have oxygen, we talk about the transfer of electrons. Oxidation is the loss of electrons, and reduction is the gain of electrons. And I taught you this mnemonic device, Leo says Ger. And by that, we mean the loss of electrons is oxidation. And then the gain of electrons is reduction. Right? So Leo Sisger will help you keep all that straight. Substances that lose electrons we say are oxidized. Anything that gains an electron is said to be reduced. And something that does the oxidizing, I'm sorry, something that is oxidized is called the reducing agent because it caused the reduction in the other thing. Um, it is the substance that does the reducing. And then a substance that is reduced is called the oxidizing agent because it caused the oxidizing on the other substance. So make sure that you know your terminology and that you answer the question I ask. If I ask you what thing is oxidized, that's different than asking you what the oxidizing agent is. In fact, it's completely the opposite thing. Don't get confused. So here's an example. If we take magnesium and sulfur and use a combination reaction to put them together into magnesium sulfide, then we know that magnesium is going to lose electrons because it's a metal, so it gives away its two valence electrons to the sulfur so that they can make an ionic bond, right? So here we formed um, magnesium ions by giving away two electrons. And Similarly, the sulfur is going to form an ion, right? But the sulfur gained the two electrons that magnesium gave away to form an ion. So we have sulfide is a 2 minus charge. And now, of course, the magnesium and sulfur stick together because they are oppositely charged. So we write half reactions to show the loss of electrons from magnesium and the gain of electrons for the sulfur. Gain is always written as though um, the electrons are one of the reactants, right? And then our product is an ion. And then for the loss, we show the element as the reactant, the ion, and the electrons as a product. You'll get used to writing these. I mean, you won't have to do too many, but you'll get used to doing it. It will come easy. Oxidation numbers help us keep track of where the electrons are and what they're up to. Sometimes it's hard to tell which thing is being oxidized and which one is being reduced, so we um, we use oxidation numbers because charge doesn't always describe everything. In any reaction, an increase in the oxidation number indicates an oxidation. So if, it, if the oxidation number is going up, then that's oxidation. Okay? And then if the oxidation number is going down, that is a reduction. That should make sense, right? When something's reduced, its oxidation number goes down. Makes sense. Um, if there's no change in 
any oxidation numbers for anything, then it's not a redox reaction. That's why double replacement reactions are not redox. It's just flipping ions around and um, partnering them in a different way. So it's not changing anybody's oxidation numbers. It's just making new partners. So let's look at the rules for assigning oxidation numbers. Now we go in order from top to bottom. So rule number one is the very first and most critical rule. You always do this one first. Atoms that are in elemental form, including diatomics, have an oxidation number of zero. So these guys, your Brinkelhoff elements, they will always be zero. And then, of course, pure substances that's monatomic. Pure substances like copper and iron and those things, of course, they will have a zero oxidation number. So we show that by putting a zero, but you don't have to put a zero there. It's just implied. It's an element. Its oxidation number is zero. Monatomic ions have the oxidation number that's equal to its charge. So use your periodic table. Remember how we read across from left to right and we have plus one for alkali metals and plus two for alkaline earth metals and then we leap across to, uh, what is it, boron? Yeah, boron and aluminum are plus three, plus four and then we start going down minus three, minus two, minus one until we get to noble gases and then we don't have to worry about it because they're always zero. They don't get to make compounds anyway. Oxygen is your next rule. Oxygen has an oxidation number of minus two unless it's in a peroxide. So how will you know if it's in a peroxide? Well, you'll know if it looks funny. Like lithium oxide should be Li2O. Lithium peroxide is going to be LiO. So if it looks like oxidation, um, like oxygen has the wrong oxidation state or like maybe somebody messed up the formula, check to see maybe it's a peroxide, right? Um, actually, peroxide will look like this, Li2O2, because peroxide is two oxygens with a two minus. Wow, I didn't mean to lie to you there. Sorry. We fixed it. We fixed it. No lies. There we go. Rule number four. Hydrogen has an oxidation number of a plus one when it's bonded to nonmetals and a minus one when it's bonded to metals. You know you can make hydrides, right? And then we can also have hydrogen attached to all kinds of other things. So if it has to be positive to attach to something that's negative, it's a plus one. And to bond to a metal, of course, it has to accept the electron instead of donate, because metals always donate. All right, moving on. Halogens are usually a minus one. Unless they are combined with oxygen, then they will be positive, and we have to use algebra to figure out exactly what charge they'll be. So if, um, if say, chlorine is bonded to a metal, like iron, aluminum, sodium, magnesium, then it gets to be a minus one. But if it's in this chlorate ion, then oxygen gets to be negative and chlorine has to do something else. It has to have a positive oxidation number then. Okay, what's next? The sum of the oxidation numbers will always equal zero for a compound or an element, right? And it will equal the value of the charge for an ion. So pay attention. Are you dealing with a compound or are you dealing with an ion? Because the sum of all the oxidation numbers has got to be equal to the overall charge of the ion or has to be zero to make a compound. Compounds are always neutral, so that's why it would have to be zero. So let's step it through and apply the rules in order. So I'm going to show you how to ask the right questions to determine the oxidation number. So here's our element um, that's, yeah, not our element. Our compound is sodium sulfate. So we need to know what's the oxidation number for the sodium, for the sulfur, and for the oxygen. Those are the elements that make up this compound. So let's do some investigating. First, we're going to ask this question. Is the substance elemental? And we can see clearly that it is made up of three elements, so it is not um an element all by itself. Next question, is the substance ionic? And you're going to look for a metal bonded to a nonmetal. We've clearly got that. Yes, this is a metal plus a nonmetal, so it's ionic. Next question, if it is ionic, 
are there any monatomic ions present? So any ions here that are made up of just one kind of atom? Yep, the sodium. And the sodium ion is an alkali metal, so we know its oxidation number is plus one. All right, so we know what the sodium is already. Okay. Next question. Are there any elements that have specific rules attached to them? And we had rule number three was about oxygen, right? Oxygen has a rule. It's minus two in most compounds. So what's the oxidation number of the oxygen? It's going to be minus two. So now the only thing we have left to work out is the sulfur. Let's see. Want to click there. Which elements do not have rules? Sulfur, right? That's the only one that we don't know. So let me write these up here again. We know that sodium was plus one, sulfur we're still working on, and oxygen was a minus two. All right, so let's look at the sulfur. How do we figure this out? We're going to use rule number eight and a little bit of algebra to figure this out. So we know that um, we have Na2, SO4, and it's a compound, so its overall charge is zero, right? And that means four oxygens, and oxygen is minus two, plus whatever sulfur is, and we have two sodiums, and sodium is worth positive one each. So now here's our algebra part. We're going to solve for the part we don't know, which is the sulfur, right? So two plus x minus eight equals zero. That means x minus six equals zero. Therefore, x is positive six, right? So sulfur is a positive six in its oxidation number. Let me, hmm, can't see my writing. I just said we're going to use x for sulfur, that's all. So we're solving for the sulfur using algebra. That's how we do it. And the oxidation number that we came up with for sulfur was plus 6. Great. Let's do another one. Now that we know how, let's ask the questions in order again. Is the substance elemental? Well, this is potassium oxalate. And that's um, not all the same atoms, right? Three elements are there. Is it ionic? Definitely, a metal and a nonmetal. And next question, is the sub if it is ionic, are there any monatomic ions present? And we know oxalate is a polyatomic ion, but the potassium is our monatomic. So that has a rule. The potassium ion is monatomic, so what's the charge? Find potassium on your periodic table. You'll see it's an alkali metal, so we got a plus one there, right? Next. Are there rules for any other elements? Definitely. What's the rule for oxygen? Minus two in most compounds, right? So the oxidation number of our oxygen is a minus two. Which elements do not have rules? Hmm. Well, let's see, we've already dealt with potassium, right? We've already dealt with oxygen, so all we're left with here is carbon. Carbon's the only one that does not have a rule, so we'll work out the charge of carbon. I'm going to use the letter C to represent carbon in my algebraic equation. So here we go. I know my overall compound has to equal zero, and I have four oxygens each of them worth a minus two. And then I've got two carbons, so I'm going to use C for that. And then two potassiums. Each potassium is a plus one. All right, so I get two plus two C equals minus eight, oops, plus a minus eight equals zero. And let's simplify even further, two C is equal to positive six, yep. And then divide both sides by two. C is equal to positive three. All right, so we know for potassium, it's a plus one. 
For carbon, it's a plus 3, and for oxygen, it's a minus 2. Oxidation number for carbon that we worked out was a plus 3. That's how you do oxidation numbers, and you'll do them the same way every time. Apply the same rules in the same order every time you do this. So here's three practice problems, and I'll do, hmm, I'll do one of these. Let you do the rest. So let's do this one because it's, it's big. I was tempted to do number two just to be mean, but I won't. All right, so the first question, is it elemental? No. Is it ionic? Yes, a metal and a nonmetal. And do we have any monatomic ions? Yep, right here. So what's the charge of barium? As an alkaline earth metal, barium is a 2+. plus. All right, anything that has a specific rule? Yep, you betcha. Oxygen, there it is. And now the only thing we have left is nitrogen. So let's work that out using algebra. Don't forget about the parentheses and what they mean for this compound. So we know we have to add up to a zero charge. Um, we have six oxygens, and they're each going to have a minus two charge. I'm going to use capital N for nitrogen. Makes sense, yeah. And then barium was a two plus. There's only one of them. All right, so now let's start simplifying our algebra. 2 plus 2n minus 12 equals 0. So I have 2n minus 10 equals 0. That makes n equal to positive 5. So nitrogen in this case is positive 5. If all you had looked at was the periodic table, then you would have told me that n was a minus 3. But in this case, because it's combined with oxygen here in a polyatomic ion, it obtains a different type of oxidation number. It doesn't have a charge necessarily because it's really just sharing electrons, but it has an oxidation number that describes how it interacts with that oxygen. We always give oxygen the minus charge because it's simply more, um, il uh, what do you call it, il electrophilic. Yeah, electronegative. That's the word I was looking for. All right, so now you know how to do it. I expect you to show me these other two when you come to class. See you all later.